In the past 15 years, extraordinary changes have begun to happen in Australia. The nation on the other side of the frontier has risen from its deathbed and has begun to fight back. And what a spectacle it is. As the first Australians challenge some of the greatest transnational companies in the world, and governments, and historians, and assumptions and attitudes, and disease and neglect, in order that they may claim back their share of the oldest continent, their country. This film is a glimpse of their epic story. When Captain Cook landed here in Botany Bay, he was under orders not to raise the Union Jack without the consent of the inhabitants of Australia. But Cook and Captain Arthur Phillip, who followed with the first fleet of convicts, both disobeyed these instructions. And what followed was one of the darkest and least known periods in the history of Britain's empire. The British declared Australia an empty land in spite of the fact that there were tribes with a total population of at least 300,000, perhaps as many as a million. No one knew exactly, because the first Australians were not counted as human beings. Decimation was swift. Aboriginal blood carried no resistance to white disease. Lieutenant Brady, Royal Marines, reported in 1788, from the great number of dead natives found in every part of Sydney Harbour, it appears that the smallpox has made dreadful havoc among them. But not nearly as much havoc as massacre. No British colony was born under so cruel a star as Australia. The early convict ships had brought thousands of white slaves, mostly English and Irish, transported for crimes of poverty and politics. And they became the instruments of massacre. Directed by Christian gentlemen, who had brought with them attitudes of racial superiority that were the staple of empire. Ironically, their cruelty was at odds with liberal reformers in Britain who were then seeking to end the slave trade. In 1837, a House of Commons Select Committee condemned the atrocities against the Aborigines. But the difference between sympathy and action was a convenient 15,000 miles. I think it's a very calculating attitude which, which makes an entire nation of people write out 200 years of history um, and, and, and then speak only about imperial history. They speak about the pioneers, the brave white pioneers, the brave women who settled the country as if we didn't ever exist. And all of that history is based also on, on the legal fiction which established for them that they legitimately owned this country. They call it terra nullius. In other words, empty continent. The law says that we did not exist in 1788. Therefore, the continent was empty, uninhabited wasteland and therefore the British had a right to occupy it. So you see, there have never been treaties here because we didn't exist legally to sign a treaty with them. The Aborigines were deemed to be subhuman, little more than animals, which was to justify not only the theft of their land, but their extermination. An edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, still in circulation when I was at school, described them as only an animal of prey, more ferocious than the leopard or the hyena. He devours his own species. So they were hunted and raped and massacred. And few doubted at the time that genocide was official policy. A government report in the 1850s spoke of the success of poisoning Aborigines, 100 of them laid out at a time. But until quite recently, little of this was even acknowledged. In Tasmania, the Aborigines were said to have died out. In fact, they were hunted along with kangaroos and almost wiped out. In New South Wales, by 1845, the tribe who had watched Captain Cook sail here into Botany Bay was reduced to three women and a man. In Victoria, an Aborigine called old Mr. Burt recalled this story told by his mother. They buried our babies with only their heads above the ground. All in a row they were. Then they had a test to see who could kick the baby's heads off the furthest. One man clobbered a baby's head off from horseback. They then spent most of the day raping the women 
Most of them were then tortured to death by sticking sharp things like spears up their vaginas until they died. They tied the men's hands behind their backs, then cut off their penis and testicles and watched them run around screaming until they died. One of the most enduring myths about the Aborigines is that they did not fight back. In fact, a war of resistance lasted more than a century, some of it here on the banks of the Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney. During the 1930s, my father built a cottage here on the beach at an Aboriginal place called Patonga. I think we knew that somebody had lived at Patonga at some time, but no one talked about it. In fact, an entire nation had lived here on and off for thousands of years. They were called the Jurag, a unique Aboriginal people, tall and slender, whose country extended to a 40-mile radius north of Sydney, and the mighty Hawkesbury River was theirs. And when the British established the town of Windsor in the early 1800s, a great war began. This war was not recorded in the Imperial Chronicles of Australia. Growing up here, I knew nothing about it, and I suspect that's still true of the people in the smart beach houses here today. And yet the Durag inflicted on the British a casualty rate greater than that sustained by the Australian Armed Forces during all of World War II. And finally, after 22 years, outnumbered and without guns, they went down fighting to the last man, woman and child, a complete nation. Today, in a land of many cenotaphs and war memorials on which invariably is written, lest we forget, not one of them stands for those who fought and fell in their own country. By the 1920s, the British invasion had caused the deaths of at least a quarter of a million black Australians. Genocide on a massive scale. But this fact remained suppressed, except in the living memory of those who survived. Here in the Northern Territory, in the great isolated heartland of Australia, the killing of Aborigines continued well into the 20th century, and most of these also remain secret. However, in 1928, 150 miles from Alice Springs, a gang of police and cattlemen massacred at least 50 Aborigines, perhaps many more, and word got out. A public inquiry was held, and its findings were summarized in these three words. The shooting was justified. In giving evidence, Constable William Murray said, we shot to kill. What use is a wounded black fella a hundred miles from civilization? <laughs>